Yeah, so I'm Jeff LeBlanc, and I am a uh, user experience team lead at Integrated Computer Solutions up the road in Bedford. We're a little company, about 100 or so folks, mostly software engineers, but we've got a clever little user experience team that we've managed to carve out in the last few years, and we're doing some interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from probably a little bit of a different perspective than a lot of you folks. Uh, I've actually been one of those kind of heathen software developers for the last 20 or so years. Um, although most of my career actually has been focused on user interface to one form or another. Um, the kind of the big reason I got into human factors actually stems going way back. For those of you who might remember, uh, Hewlett Packard had a medical division kind of in this area. It was actually right, again, pretty much across the street in Waltham uh, and, and in Andover. And I kind of started there as a developer, and I get pulled into the UX team, kind of kicking and screaming at the time. But I learned a lot from the folks there, and kind of had a few watershed moments, including literally seeing family members hooked up to monitoring equipment that we had worked on at one point or another. So it's a real kick in the head to say, boy, I hope we got the, the front end, the interface, and everything correct when you see something like that. So ever since then, I've been much more focused on user interface and of late uh, user experience. <clears throat> um, for about the last 10 or so years, I've actually also been fortunate enough to teach the graduate HCI course at WPI. So I've kind of um, got a fairly broad base of knowledge. I'm sure most of you folks have certainly a, a deeper skill set than me. But I've been fortunate to kind of have two sides of the, the equation, if you will. And, being able to combine those and do some pretty interesting stuff, some of which I want to talk to you folks about tonight. So I want to start the, the presentation with a little bit of a question. Ask, have anybody seen any good movies recently? Okay, and some of these movies aren't exactly recent. You might remember back. Um, I picked these for a, a reason. So 2001, which was actually out in 68, I think. So I don't know if anybody actually saw that. And we do have somebody who saw it in the theaters. Good for you. A couple of folks. Uh, Minority Report, 2002. That one I actually was seeing movies by that point in time. Uh, and the Iron Man movies, and also up to and including the Avengers. And all of these, besides being interesting movies on their own right, have kind of one kind of common thread, at least that I found in them, was they really were pushing the boundaries of what technology could do in the real world at the time, in terms of especially user interface. Uh, as part of my graduate course, we actually do kind of look at some of the Iron Man movies and kind of shift, uh, shift forward in time to some of the particular areas where Tony Stark is interacting with some of his technology. And I'll talk about that a little more as we go. So the common thread to that is <clears throat> kind of looking to inspiration, uh, looking to fiction, seeing what was done. In this case, we'll start in the past. Art has always driven things in the real world. And if you're a technologist, you kind of get to really look at some of the things that people have postulated, can we do this? Is this possible? Maybe not at the time, but as technology improves and we learn more about the world and what we can do, we've really done some good things that people only dreamed about. Um, Jules Verne wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Years and years later, a fellow named Simon Lake was reputed to be inspired by that. And he was one of the folks who was actually working on the first submarines. He was actually, I believe, based down in Connecticut. So he's kind of a local guy. To mention, I've uh, got some ties to WPI. Robert Goddard is a big name in the, in the Worcester area. He is reputed to have read War of the Worlds back when he was a kid and was actually inspired by that whole notion of the ability to travel between planets. And that's something that might have eventually inspired him to go on and create modern rocketry. So a lot of folks over the years have really been inspired by things that they've read or things that they've seen and said, I wish we could do that. Hollywood may have replaced fiction for a lot of folks. I'm personally still an avid reader, but watch plenty of movies over time. And I've, I've drawn my share of um, inspirations from them as well. Hollywood's an interesting animal. Sometimes they get stuff just blazingly wrong and you cringe. Um, this particular picture, I actually remember seeing Jurassic Park in the cinema with a bunch of folks from HP. And we literally all cringed at the same time when the little girl went, it's a Unix system. Looking at the big crazy spotlight coming down on the 3D interface on a, a silicon graphics machine. It's like, well, yeah, it probably was actually since it was an SGI. 
But that wasn't the UI to it. It's much more command line. Oh, we did have X windows, obviously, at the time. But yeah, we all kind of cringed at that. It's like, all right, we, we don't want to do that one. So if you kind of know what's going on, sometimes you look at these things and you go, no, no, that's, that's just not right. But sometimes they get it right. Sometimes when they really do their job correctly, that proverbial movie magic, it's a big emotional impact. Right? It really can inspire you. It can have that type of a, a visceral, wow, that's just cool. And if you're a technologist, those are those little moments that you kind of really look for. It's like, wow, I wish we could do that. Um, I've actually been kind of doing some back reading. Norman's book on emotional design. I was reading that on a, on a trip, actually, to the West Coast recently. And he talks about some of the different levels that design can affect us at. Reflective, where we're kind of really kind of stepping back and stopping to think about, you know, what's going on here? What's, what's really happening? What does this mean to me? Behavioral, which is just kind of more of a, uh, does this really work? Does it not work? Can I do what I, what I have to do? And again, the visceral. And that really is the, the gut impact, the wow, that's cool, or boy, that's really terrible. I don't really want to pursue that type of thing. I don't want to see it anymore. Let's move along here. That emotional impact is what Hollywood strives for. People pay to see it, right? That's the, the whole thrill, the interest. So that type of emotional design can you know, be something we look at on the big screen just as a whole, or we can really focus down to some of the smaller elements and actually kind of pick them apart and say, how does this work? How would this work in the real world? And when they get it right, it's just really, really cool. So this particular image actually is from the Avengers, and done a little bit of digging around on this. It's from a fellow named Jace Hansen. Um, he's the guy who actually did a lot of the interface work for the Avengers, for all the Iron Man movies, a couple of Wolverine movies, a uh, few other ones that I'm blanking on at the moment. But he's got a really cool website, jace.tv. So definitely check it out. If you're a visual designer, lots of interesting stuff. A few people who might be typing this in right now, just try not to drool on your keyboards. There's some really, really neat things on there. <clears throat> Something else kind of going along those lines, going back to books, it's actually this book here called, aptly enough, Make It So, Interface Design from Science Fiction. This is a really good read. If you guys, anybody wants to check this out at the break, feel free. Uh, this is something I discovered last year, and it really kind of was another one of the things that started to inspire me of how can we learn from the things that Hollywood is doing? How can we kind of draw from those experiences that we've had at the cinema and really kind of look at them and translate them possibly into real world things. Um, their website, Sci-Fi Interfaces, is pretty much just a blog, um, but they analyze a lot more stuff than they've actually got in the book. Um, pretty much every month they're, they're putting up some new movie or something more interesting. Uh, it was pretty actually entertaining just reading how they ripped apart Prometheus last year, which I was doing myself. So I was like, yeah, yeah, they screwed that up and that up and that up and that up. Uh, it's a good read. So definitely check it out if you get the chance. So people have been drawing their inspirations from Hollywood for, for years and years. And I've kind of given you a, a couple examples, which you, you know, may or may not have been familiar with. Here's some ones that you might have been. Um, Star Trek, what, late 60s or so was out. Um, Kirk's been using the communicator for a long, long time. In the 90s, Motorola came out with, and they actually even called it the StarTac phone. I actually know a few people who had one. And remember that first moment somebody went, flip? Oh, hello. It's like, hey, I know what that is. And again, if you kind of do some of the, the background research, and there have been kind of anecdotal, but stories about some of the engineers who worked on that project who went, yeah, we might have seen an episode or two of Star Trek in our lifetimes, and it might have maybe influenced our design. Skip ahead a few years to, when was Next Generation? Late 80s, early 90s. Um, they had, they actually called it the data pad back then. It was P-A-D-D, -D, I forget the acronym. But, you know, Picard was, I don't think he was checking his email at the time, but I'm sure he was doing something useful to the ship. Lo and behold, fortunately, this one didn't take us 30 years. You know, we have all these tablets. You know, they're, they're pretty much ubiquitous at this point. So again, Hollywood, or at least the entertainment industry, is kind of leading the charge there. And the engineers are kind of following up. Which, I mean, makes sense if you look at the, the technology crowd. I mean, a lot of us are geeks by nature. I'll raise my hand on that. 
I'm always looking for things that I can kind of draw on and say, hey, that looks really cool. I wish I could do that. Another one that's basically blatantly, I don't want to call it a ripoff, but a, a solid inspiration comes from one of the X-Men movies. This is actually something where these guys are specifically quoted to say, yeah, we saw this in the X-Men, and this was a perfect fit for what we're trying to do, so we built the thing. Uh, was it Xenovision? They basically made what they called a dynamic sand table, basically something that's used uh, in the military world, you know, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, the notion of literally a big table of sand, and you can rearrange things and put units down and arrange a battlefield. They took it to the level of being able to actually dynamically change the height of things. So that's the image on the far side there. This one's from the movie. It's actually showing the Statue of Liberty. It basically kind of rose up from the center of the table. They built one of the things, which is actually pretty impressive. So for myself, kind of leading us on to the, the second chunk of the, of the presentation, if you will, my own little, little moments of ins inspiration, going back to the original movies that I put up the, the posters for. Right? So one of the big things about 2001 back at the time, it wasn't necessarily visually stunning by today's standards, but they're still doing things that we're having a hard time with, specifically Dave's old friend Hal. Voice interface, artificial intelligence, affecting the world. We can kind of do parts of that. And it's, it's really one of those things that if you think back in your memory, it's one of the first things people have really seen that type of an interaction. Again, it's had that visceral appeal. Minority Report is kind of more or less the, the one that gets the credit for bringing gestures into people's minds. Tom Cruise, those are and his one hand on there, he actually had the little gloves on to, so the cameras could detect the fingers easier. But a gestural interface, that's one that certainly is gaining popularity these days. So, being the geek that I am, when I was actually watching the Iron Man movies, I started to think about these different technologies and some of the work that's been kicking around the ICS shop. And I said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could combine some of these technologies, kind of research what the state of the art is, and actually build me an intelligent agent? had some limited success with, and that's kind of what we're going to walk through here is the, the steps and the pieces. So <clears throat> the initial piece is the notion of building the new or the natural user interface. Okay? This is a topic of research right now. It's something that's starting to get a, a fair amount of press and a lot of traction in the research community. Uh, lots of different definitions, like anything that's new. But the, the ones that I've seen that interest me are these ideas that the interface effectively becomes invisible to what you're doing. Now, that's something that we all strive for in, in any UI design. Uh, but it's based on natural elements. The idea that you're interacting with something, okay, we won't even necessarily specify a computer, let's just say system for the moment. And the interaction is as natural as it is in the real world. Making gestures, pointing at things, you know, if you're like me, talking with your hands as well as your voice. But having those actions actually do something in the world. And there's a good quote I bumped into, uh, URL references here. It's hard for an interface to seem natural if you interact with it in an artificial way. We're all used to mice. We're all used to keyboards, right? I mean, it's, that's the tools of the trade. We've been using them for years and years. But there's nothing natural about them. The only thing that's a mouse in nature is something cats chase. Keyboards are totally artificial. We've adapted to them as people, but you know, in reality, they are artifacts of technology, the things that we've had to learn how to use. So would it possibly be better, and I think the answer is yes, the jury's still out, but would it be better if we could interact with these systems in a way that's closer to interacting with the real world and real people? And this is not a new idea. Now this goes back to some of the stuff that Steve Mann was postulating back in the 70s and 80s, you know, ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing. Again, fairly novel ideas at the time, but we didn't have the technology to really pull it off. We're getting there. Right. So the NUI, as it's considered right now, is basically um, a meld of a number of different technologies. And again, these are things that we may have seen, but we may not have really used in depth. Right. Touch technologies, eh, pretty much ubiquitous these days. Most people, at least in a certain crowd like this, have smartphones or have seen them. Again, tablets also becoming very common. We see them all on TV. Uh, you can't watch a football game these days without getting bombarded with uh, ads for the Microsoft Surface. So that, that notion's starting to get out there. 
Gestures is an interesting one. <clears throat> Again, we've seen it on TV, and there are commercial products that have had kind of a reasonable level of success so far. Uh, Microsoft Connect has been out for a, a number of years at this point, and uh, the Wii actually predated that, I think, by a year or two. Again, the notion of just being able to move around instead of sitting there and interacting with something that's artificial like a keypad, you're doing something. And if you've ever actually tried to play any of these gestural games and they're set up this way, it's tiring. I remember actually playing Wii Tennis at some point when it first came out. I was like, wow, my arm's tired. I actually had a, a workout. It wasn't the same as swinging a tennis racket, but they did hit a fairly natural motion. It was uh, Once I played with it a little bit, I got the idea of, okay, I'm doing this gesture, I'm hitting the tennis ball. Same thing with bowling. Right. <clears throat> Voice interaction, again, we've, that goes back in, visually in Hollywood at least back to 2001. There are probably older examples, but that's kind of the one that people really think about. <clears throat> Commercial products, you know, Google Glass is probably the one that's getting the most notoriety these days. Okay, Glass, let's do something. It pops up the nice little menu of things that you can do but it's triggered by a voice command. Yes, there are others, or I'll get to those too, but that's one that really popped out to me as something where, in Google's case, they're really striving to hit this level of a natural interface where I'm talking to something slash someone and the world is responding. As uh, human factors folks, we're all familiar with eye tracking. We've seen the technologies. They've been around for a while. What's interesting to me about them, though, is that the price is coming way down. Um, you can get an eye tracking system low end these days for what, $100, $200, something like that. I mean, they used to be thousands, very cost prohibitive. So that's coming way down. That's actually down to the point that, wow, maybe this isn't something that's just going to be in the human factors lab. Maybe I can actually start to develop a system around this. Brain machine interfaces, yeah, you still got to either slap a big helmet on or you know, cram a spike through the back of your head. Not something really that we're quite ready to explore just yet. But I'd say it's coming, just a question of when. All right. So that's the NUI. <clears throat> the other part of it is kind of the, the thing that I wanted to get towards was, again, the notion of the intelligent agent. Okay. There's my man Tony Stark interacting with Jarvis again, specifically trying to do some problem solving in the movie. Um, this is one that I was actually exposed to in a fair amount of detail uh, in Roland's class, actually, back at Bentley on, uh, I think it was actually called Intelligent Agents or Intelligent User Interfaces. So this is the book we use, AI Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig. I took AI years and years ago, you know, 20-something 20, 20 years ago in grad school at WPI, I took artificial intelligence, knowledge acquisition, computer vision, all this stuff back then. Jump ahead 20 years to this, I'm like, you know, the state of the world is still more or less the same for a lot of these technologies. We've Yes, there have been improvements, but the, you know, the wonderful promise of AI, how oh, think computers will be thinking, like, yeah, not so much yet. But what was interesting to me about this particular approach was the way that they were really looking at this and saying, okay, we have a specific application, you know, not something that's really generic, not like a rule-based system or a knowledge-based system, but how can we make something that another person can communicate with and really help them in their day to day in whatever particular task that they're trying to do. And I thought that was a pretty neat approach. So when I saw the Iron Man movies and basically saw how they were portraying on the screen how Tony was interacting with Jarvis, that was one of the things that really popped into my head. It's like, I've seen this. Moreover, I've actually seen some of the background pieces and how they were put together. So that got the wheels turning. Now, an agent, which agents kind of got a lot of bad press in the matrix, but typically one of the definitions that I've seen is an intelligent or a rational agent is something that is able to work with its environment. It has some type of sensors, so it knows what is going on out in the world. Those sensors vary. They could be visual. They could be audio. Um, you know, they could be alarm sensors, pressure sensors, whatever it may be, but some way they're getting information in about the real world. They have a model that they maintain about what the state of the world is. Again, it could be very simple, pressure switch on and off, part on the conveyor belt, part damaged, part not damaged, whatever it may be. And thirdly, they have a way of actually interacting with their environment. So depending on the state of the world and 
some set of rules, now we'll, we'll call that the intelligence portion for a moment, which might be vastly overstating things, but based on that, they make a decision and then they affect the real world. That's the agent part of it. It could be a mechanical Waldo going down and picking up a part. It could be sounding an alarm. It could be talking to you as a, you know, a, a partner or an agent if it has some type of voice capabilities. Whatever it may be. Those are kind of the, the three main steps that are, are thought of as defining an agent piece. Again, we look back at the movies and that was more or less what they were doing in the Iron Man films. Tony was interacting with the system. It was definitely a computer system. But it had the capability of not only putting up the cool displays, but actually affecting things within the workshop. So that really was you know, his agent. Um, so if you're a computer scientist like me, if I put my developer hat on for a minute, pretty interesting. It's like, yeah, the focus of the movie was, was the suit and the, the fight scenes and all that good stuff. But if you think about the amount of work that would actually go into building a Jarvis system, it's nuts. I mean, there's a, so much programming to go and actually get um, what I refer to as the brains, the artificial intelligence part. You've got natural language processing going on. You've got the rule system. You've got the control system for the, the physical world going on in there. Any one of those things could take a company months or years to develop. So having that all in one package is actually pretty interesting. Now the notion of the agent is, again, something that's been around for a while. A lot, um, much before we had Jarvis, we had the Knowledge Navigator. A lot of you probably remember this. This is from 87. This was one of uh, Apple's big marketing pushes back then. And it's pretty interesting to go back and watch this today. If you get the opportunity, definitely Google it up and, or check it out on YouTube, whatever it may be. They have a lot of interesting pieces in there that are still fairly relevant. Right? You have the college professor who's trying to prepare a, a lecture. He's running late. so. He opens up something that was fairly book-like and puts it on the table. Flat screen, tablet, as we would call it today. He's interacting with his little buddy up in the corner there. That's his agent. Uh, he's going off. He's doing searching. He's correlating information. He's triggering a, basically a video conference call with one of his friends, which the agent kind of manipulates for him. Uh, the agent nicely tells him that his mother is calling in the middle of things. He says, yes, I ended a voicemail. Just mom. It's a pretty interesting video. Again, even by today's standards, we still can't quite do all of these things. But we can do a fair number of them. Okay, some of these technologies actually have come to the forefront. Jump ahead with Apple to Siri. How many people in here actually have an iPhone and, and use Siri? All right? Since I conveniently have Todd in the front row. So give me on a scale of 1 to 10. How good is it? Pretty good. Anybody else want to up or down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Gives it a two. Ouch. No love for Siri. All right. Okay to justify that? So, so we have some confidence issues with Siri. All right, hold that thought. So speaking of that, conveniently, we have the hype cycle from Gartner, which I kind of, I actually learned about it here, and I've been checking it ever since. I find this a very interesting thing to look at. Um, so what do we have for some of these technologies that are out there, some of the ones that I've been kind of talking about? Well, dealing with Siri, let's talk about speech recognition for a second. That's actually way out at the end of the curve, according to the Gartner guys. So that's this little bubble out here. Now what's interesting to me is it's in light blue. So according to this, they're at two to five years to hit the plateau, but they're actually putting it on the plateau now. OK, well, maybe that's a slide bug. Voice recognition has been like two to five years out for 20 years. 
it seems. You know, it's again, it's one of those things that seems to be getting asymptotically closer to being really, really good. And everybody keeps pushing it out in the next version. And, and admittedly, they do get better and better every year. And you know, we've got some mixed reviews on, on Siri and whatnot. But it is a technology that is starting to get into people's minds and some, seen some acceptance in the consumer marketplace. Gesture control, on the other hand, is back out in the trough of disillusionment. And that's actually down here, gesture control. So again, that's something that they're thinking is two to five years out. Gaming crowd's already kind of used to it. Everybody else, maybe not so much. But we're, we're at least in theory, heading up the, the curve. Virtual assistants, now let's go out to here. Can we consider Siri a virtual assistant? Yeah, maybe. So <clears throat> according to this, it's taking the really steep plunge down into the trough right now, which kind of more speaks to the, the two than the seven rating. But again, it's an area of, of improvement. It's something that's just going to continue to get better. Uh, one article I read actually said that you know, 2014, it's the year of the assistant. It's some, a lot of time is going to be spent on these interfaces. A lot of money will be invested. And you know, hopefully get some good commercial success. Do I believe that? Or do I believe the two to five? I would probably hedge my bets. But then again, I'm also admittedly not an Apple user. I don't have a lot of experience with Siri for good or bad. So we'll see what 2014 brings. I think it's going to be interesting either way. So with that as a background, I kind of want to bring you guys through an actual specific use case. This is something that we worked on at ICS over the last year. And it's, I don't think I'd quite call it mature, but it's at least out of the cradle. Um, I wanted Jarvis, bottom line. Right? So I said, all right, how can we do this? And we conveniently, through some of the work with uh, our partners, had a few pieces of technology basically drop in my lap that I said, all right, I can work with this. So the goal of the project was to combine a lot of different input modalities. Right? I specifically wanted to work with voice recognition. And it's been around for a while. I wanted to see where the, the state of the world is. Uh, with gestures, because it's just really, really cool. And we threw in facial recognition in there, quite honestly, just because the SDK supported it. But we found a particularly um, compelling, I think, use for it. So we put all these together. We combined them with some types of multimedia output. And our goal was to create an intelligent agent, or at least get as close to it as we could. How well did we succeed? Well, let's take a look. Welcome to my buddy Jarvis. So we'll start off with the gesture technology and see what this can do for us. So again, we have kind of Tom Cruise there. Gestures is a technology right now that requires some additional hardware. Right? Um, standard webcams don't have the capability to do the, the 3D modeling that this needs. Uh, some of the common ones that are out there, again, people are familiar with the Microsoft Connect. The camera that I'm using here is actually from uh, Creative. It's a Sens 3D. And we have the Leap Motion camera, which I'm actually not currently using, although it is very high on my to-do list. So first, we needed the hardware. OK, check. Hardware I have. The technologies uh, vary. Right? Um, 3D cameras used to be pure stereo cameras that literally just had the two different types of lenses. And they were using stereo vision to get their depth. And they were bloody expensive. I remember using one back in graduate school, and somebody quoted me the price for it. And I was in terror that I was going to knock this thing over, and that would be a big chunk of my tuition. Now they're 80 bucks, right? Um, or the creative one in particular, uh, this guy down here, it uses a technology called time of flight. Um, basically, it's bouncing light off an object and kind of reading the, the reflections. Uh, that does clock in around $100. The Connect camera uses an infrared and structured light capability. That clocks in, I think I got a used one for about 80 bucks. And the Leap, which is also infrared, um, $85 on the pre-order. So gone from a chunk of my tuition to beer money at this point, which is kind of nice. So again, we have the hardware. These things all behave slightly differently. Um, the Connect camera has a range of approximately four meters. 
the 3D Sense camera has a range of about a meter, and the Leap cameras only got a couple of feet. It's actually pretty much intended for right over your desktop. So the range varies. And depending on your application, I actually consider this a feature. All right, so yeah, the Leap, as I said, it's got a short range. It's basically projecting out a little bubble of infrared right up above there. Um, once you get beyond a, a couple of feet, it doesn't work too well. But if you're in its sweet spot, kind of basically about a foot or so above it, it's pretty accurate. So one of the challenges that we've been thinking about for a while around the shop is now that we've got this technology, what do we do with it? Okay, how do we really interact with it? What I'm doing here is pretty simple. You know, I'm just using a swipe gesture and I'm actually causing the, the slides to turn. That's easy. You know, that's, that's a fairly universal gesture. So that's, that's a simple one. The big question though is how do you develop a gestural language? How do you really interact with things on can we do it on a more general basis? Or do we have to look at things that are really specific to the problem that we're trying to solve? So if I want to go and give an open hand gesture, what does that mean? Does that mean stop what you're doing? That's one possibility which we as people kind of recognize. It's like, whoa, stop. But in the case of this particular application, the open hand just happens to be one of the five or so gestures that the thing actually recognizes. So I've done some other programming where I've actually had to use this as a trigger to basically do a mode change. Not natural at all, but it works and it was good for purposes of the demonstration. Um, last week I mentioned I was out at a trade show. Uh, I had the opportunity to actually go over and go into San Francisco and talk to the Leap Motion guys. They actually have a whole UX team there that's looking at this stuff basically as their day job, which I thought was really, really cool. So we had a good long chat about this type of stuff, and they were explaining that, yeah, this is what they're, one of the things that they're trying to solve. You know, how, how can they recommend to their developers to use gestures? You know, they've opened this great Pandora's box. Here's an $80 camera. It'll, it'll recognize hand gestures and swipes and fingers. You can, you can basically play the piano on the thing. But what does that really mean in terms of all the possible gesture-based applications that are out there? How do you make a gestural language? So it's kind of a tough nut to crack right now. Another issue to keep in mind is the notion of arm fatigue. This is something I've, I've noticed playing around with the leap as well. Kind of, you've got to kind of keep your hand over it, interact with things, and it looks really good on screen. You know, Tom Cruise was doing his thing, and he was moving through the, the scenes in there, and he was looking through, I think it was the, the videotape or whatnot. What you didn't see was the behind the scenes of, it took them hours, if not days, to film just this few minutes of footage because his arms got tired. You know, do this for 10 minutes. You know, this is, this is a, a workout just on its own. So arm fatigue's an issue. It's not something that we can say, hey, let's just jump right in and start making everything gestures. Unless you're going to start keeping dumbbells by the side of your desk to get better in better shape for using your interface. It's not quite there yet. But it is a possibly valid thing that we can use along with other forms of input. So we have to find the right thing to use. Right? We need to find the right environment the thing that's going to make sense for us to actually want to use this stuff versus just a touch interface, okay? or for that matter, a mouse and keyboard. And there are ones. Okay? There, are, there are, might be reasons where we specifically don't want to or can't touch the screen. One of them might be medical. Right? If you're in a, a surgical theater, for instance, okay? you don't want you know, bodily fluids, blood, whatever it might be. You can't actually reach over and swipe at the screen. That would be kind of nasty. But you can wave your hand at it, okay? or use voice input, or use one of these other modalities. So the question really is finding the right opportunity there. What is the right environment? What's the right problem to apply this technology to? Another thing to worry about is unintentional gestures. Okay? You can decide to consider this the live mic problem. If you accidentally do something, you wave your hands, and the system says, oh, you were doing this. I should do whatever. In this type of an environment, maybe not a big deal. I might accidentally change a slide. Going back to my medical one, if something you get a false positive there, that could be a big problem. All right. And then finally, unrecognized gestures. Okay. Same type of a notion. I actually do what I mean to do. The system doesn't respond correctly. We have these problems with all sorts of technologies anyway. Right. We like to think that, oh, well, that's 
you've got these conditions of errors if we're using a mouse and a keyboard where you know we're really we're 100 percent accurate no, you're not okay. you make typos you click the wrong buttons what is the level of accuracy we've got with these technologies i don't know off the top of my hand i'd, I'd actually be curious to see if somebody has done the research on that uh, that's on my to-do list for the going forward but we aren't 100 percent accurate with these technologies that we're very comfortable with so where are the boundaries Where's the, the percentage accuracy on gestures? Where's the percentage accuracy on the stuff we know? And how far do we have to go to bridge the gap? There are things that we can do to kind of work around some of these problems just from the technical side. To reduce false positives, there are a few very kind of just simple programming techniques uh, that we can do. We can look at certain reserved gestures or special actions. Okay, so if we do, you know, again, the, the open hand gesture I used to trigger a mode change, that was a very specific thing. It, it coded up easily. It did what I wanted it to do. That was good. You can use something like clutching, which is basically having a, only a certain level of range or a certain special action that you do to turn on the gestures. What's cool about this camera and why I consider it a feature is that I'm further than a meter away and it's not doing anything. But when I cross the plane, then it actually knows to do the right thing. So in this particular case, it's a feature. This is also really good at a trade show, by the way. So I, we actually did have a demo that used the Kinect camera. We ran it for a couple hours, and when we realized that people kind of walking behind us were going to cause problems, we said, all right, let's stick to the closer range things. Another one is just multimodal input. Okay, so I also have to, as well as doing gestures, maybe I combine that with voice or mouse or keyboard or whatever it may be to get the, um, the impact that I want. These will work. Okay, I've played around with all these things, and yeah, I can make the system do what I want it to do, but depending on the technique and how you implement it, it isn't really natural. Now we're back to the notion of, okay, I have to adapt myself to the technology to get the effect that I want. I'm taking a step away from my Jarvis interface by having to do these things. Okay. Nature of the world right now. This might be something that we're able to solve with a bit more advancement. So that's gestures. Okay. The other piece of the equation was the voice interaction. And this is a real interesting one. Again, it's, it's a technology that's been around for a long time and it's had you know, various degrees of success. A lot of that depends not only on the hardware but what you're applying it to, what you're trying to accomplish. So I looked at the world this way. I kind of broke up my notion of voice input into different interaction modes. I have a command mode where I basically have a limited set of grammar that I say, okay, I want you to do this. And if I say the right word or phrase, then it does the right thing. A very limited vocabulary to get the effect that I want. This works pretty well. Okay, lots of systems do things like that. I mean, again, the Google Glass example we mentioned earlier. Okay, Glass kind of turns it on, puts it in command mode. Now do whatever you need to do. Seems to work. Um, statistics I've seen on that give that a very high level of accuracy. The number I basically pulled out was about 95%, possibly upwards, depending on the nature of the grammar, um, size of the room, ambient noise, just other things like that can affect it. But it works pretty well. Next is dictation. Basically, free form, I talk, the speech gets converted into text or an internal text string if you're a programmer, and then you do something with it. Maybe you just slap it right onto the screen from a word processor. Maybe you take that text and you actually run it through a natural language parser to have it extract the real meaning of what you want to do. Very Jarvis-y. And Tony's always telling Jarvis to do things. Smart enough, the computer is smart enough to understand what he wants, whether it's a real command or if he's just being sarcastic. I've done natural language processing. I shudder to think at the amount of resources it would take to actually crunch up that type of a rule base. It would be pretty cool if we could. Statistics on that, I've seen out of the box 85% accuracy on things. Training can help improve that. Uh, the nuance guys actually claim that they can get upwards of 99% in the latest Dragon speech. Okay. True or not, I don't know. Right? I've used Dragon a while back. It was pretty good. I don't know if I call it 99%, but it seemed pretty effective the times that I have played around with it. So, uh, depending on who you listen to, that number is going to vary. But even at 85% out of the box, that's not bad. You know, again, consider even just talking to people 
miscommunications that you might have, times when you've had to have people repeat things, whatever it may be. We combine some of these things together, we get kind of what I was thinking of as my agent mode. You know, the ability to do commands and hopefully the ability to even do dictation level speech. Didn't remotely get there, but command, command mode seemed to work pretty well. And the other part of that is interaction. The ability to actually talk with my agent and have him do things for me. Hey Jarvis. Jarvis. Jarvis doesn't like the echo. Jarvis. Yeah. So, so, I was, so of course like all demos, it's not going to work when I needed it to. And it probably doesn't like the, the microphone echo. So we'll try this. Let's see. Jarvis. Jarvis. Next. Yeah, of course. We'll come back to this. <laughs> so again, trust and confidence. <laughs> Nothing works in a demo. Um, voice, even when it is working correctly, even when he's not leaving me high and dry, Jarvis had the same type of problems that I described earlier for gestures. The first one of which, again, is the live mic. How do you deal with false positives? Some of you folks right, remember, might remember Reagan's quote from the 80s. You know, my fellow Americans, I'm pleased to announce that today we have signed legislation that will outlaw Russia. We begin bombing in five minutes. That's an actual quote that was from a sound check, actually, at one of Reagan's speeches. That was not intended to get out into the real world. Obviously, it did. People weren't happy. So how do we? solve that type of problem, again, we have the technology to kind of get us there, but how do we work around it? So we have the live mic, and the flip side of that is even if Jarvis was paying attention, why isn't he recognizing what I'm saying? So trust and confidence. Um, the more real a system gets, the worse this is in terms of frustration. All right? um, as people, we tend to anthropomorphize things, whether they're computer systems, um, you know, maybe even ones that aren't intended to be realistic. Maybe it's just simple things that you're using, everyday devices that frustrate you. Maybe it's your pet. You know, whatever it may be, we do tend to anthropomorphize things. And when they don't work, we get frustrated. Okay? That confidence level, if it isn't as high as it should be, if our trust is violated, we get angry. Again, it's just the human condition. Um, Fogg listed a lot of social cues when interacting with both people and objects. The physical nature of interaction, the psychological, the language level, which is something that I've found particularly of interest to me when kind of designing this system. Also the social dynamics portion of it, the give and take, the, the interplay between myself and whatever I'm working with. And social roles. Right? How is things supposed to behave? If I give it a certain man or a certain stimulus, what should it do? So <clears throat> it is a question of trust. Now obviously here, Jarvis just hosed me. I actually did have a fairly high level of trust and confidence that it was going to do what I expected it to do, mainly because I've been playing with it for an entire week at a trade show and was testing it earlier tonight. However, it's not working and I'm not happy. We'll come back to that. So the final piece was the output. All right, um, there's a number of different ways to do this. This is not a fully solved problem, but this is another one of those technologies that just gets better and better all the time. Voice synthesis, text-to-speech. Um, you've all probably called the bank and gotten their automated system, and it's put you on hold, and you've listened to the computer voice, and you kind of got annoyed by it. Um, those technologies, I've played with a few of them, at least in the, the Microsoft world. They've been shipping computer voices for a while. The one that ships with Windows 8, they call Anna, it's not bad. It's definitely much less war games -y than some of the other ones that you might have played with once upon a time. So text-to-speech, the degree of naturalness is going to vary, but it's very flexible. Okay, that's kind of the big advantage to it. The other way to do voice output is through canned responses. And a lot of telephony systems tend to do this so they can get away from that unnatural feeling. Customers have complained. They don't like talking to a computer. All right, we'll take away the computer, and we'll have the computer just play sound files. You're still talking to a computer, but it's not as unnatural. Okay, that social aspect of it kind of is back in play there. You almost feel like it could maybe be a person on the other side. 
Much more natural, but obviously very limited, because you have to record a lot more sound files and kind of cover a lot more different situations. If you're just using text-to-speech, you just add in a new text string and you're good to go. So the case study is my buddy Jarvis here. It's a model-based agent. It stores at least a basic state of the world. Uh, in this case, what set of slides it's doing. I basically set out to make what I call PowerPoint on steroids. Uh, it knows the slides. It knows the sensors. It, in theory, knows what I'm saying. And it reacts to them. And the, the official project title is Intelligent Presentation Assistant. Um, but I call it Jarvis for obvious reasons. So what Jarvis does when he's on his game is he responds to gestures, he responds to voice. It all uses this particular camera that I have up here, the creative camera. Um, this was all done using the Intel Perceptual Computing SDK. This was an initiative that Intel started about a year ago, actually. My boss sent me an email that said, check this out, go buy one. I said, OK, <laughs> sure, I'm all over that. Um, the SDK is free those of you who are programmers. Uh, the hardware is you specifically do need this camera. It's basically wired in to use this for gestures. Although it does support um, other webcams for facial recognition and for voice interaction. So it's kind of nice. Uh, it's a C++ based toolkit. Any developers out there? Anybody that at least knows how to spell C++? A couple folks, OK. Uh, and it contains the things that I've showed you thus far. Actually, the voice recognition, which I've tried, the gestures, and facial recognition. So these things were all built into the SDK. I looked at that as a toolbox and said, I can work with this. So what did we do? Well, first we started looking at what my limitations were. What can this particular piece of hardware do for me? Again, the range is only about a meter, but in my mind, that's a feature. It's really designed for you to be sitting in front of the camera and interacting with it. Uh, it doesn't get anything that's behind you. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, and it's worked pretty well, honestly, as uh, a presentation tool because, again, it kind of gives me the ability to, if I want to change slides, I go past that clutching point and I hit it. Okay, and if I'm back out here kind of talking with my hands, I don't hit it. So that, to me, works out well. It supports about eight hand poses out of the box. Okay, again, for instance, the, the big five hand gesture, thumbs up, thumbs down, a couple other ones. So those are out of the box. Uh, it does not deal with any kind of moving hand gestures at this point, although this is the first version of the SDK. So hopefully that's something that going, they're going to deal with. And I think they have to. I mean, the, the leap came out after this, and the leap is specifically set up to do anything you want with your fingers. So they have to bring their game up. Um, you can, or I can, as the case may be, get around some of these problems, incorporate other hand gestures, and I think actually deal with their skeletal model, but it's a lot of vector math to do so. I don't know about you guys, but eigenvectors were long ago and far away from me, so this is not something I plan on tackling anytime soon. But the capabilities at least built into the SDK. Now, the facial detection was something that we decided to incorporate as one possible solution for the live mic problem. We basically thought about the ideas of social cues. Okay? If I'm talking to somebody, presumably they might get the cue that I'm giving them information or asking them a question, or if I said, you know, hey, can you, can you turn the lights on or off or whatever it may be, the person might get the cue to do it. So what we did was we used the facial recognition to look for the face detection. So this little blue bubble down in the bottom there, you guys might have noticed it kind of popping on or off. Right now it's off. But when I come into camera range, it basically detects my face. And that's my visual cue, so now that I know that it's on. So if Jarvis was paying attention, he would actually respond to my voice commands right now. And if I look away, then after about a second or two, that actually times out. So we tried to incorporate that notion of a social cue and use that piece of technology to solve the live mic problem. Doesn't work bad, actually. It really solved a lot of the issues that I was bumping into. The other one <coughs> was levels of accuracy, confidence levels. And kudos to Todd for helping me out with some of this. Um, the recognition level on this has really varied widely over the course of this project. Uh, I've used three different laptops, and it really seems to want to vary depending on what laptop I'm using, what flavor of Windows I'm using. I actually went back from Windows 8 to Windows 7 because Windows 8 was causing me all manner of havoc. We won't 
go there. Um, but it's varied. So what we've done is uh, we basically implemented a confidence level. So we will be detecting text, but we will right now reject anything that we're not getting at least a 48% confidence level on. Uh, I was getting a lot of false positives even when looking at it before I started to incorporate this. Once I got that in there, things started to work a whole lot better. So we're just using a, a command mode style interface. So I really have to specifically target Jarvis and tell him to do a certain limited set of things and then he responds. So depending on what particular hardware I'm running on, uh, mic input levels, things like that, it varies. Also, again, the, um, I think it's just the echo that's messing it up, but anytime I'm in a big room, it becomes problematic, because this is basically just an array level microphone, so it's getting all sorts of ambient stuff. So we're working on it. Uh, in practice, Jarvis works pretty well. I'd actually call it uh, between 40 and 60 percent confidence, it's actually working pretty well, interpreting my commands and doing the right thing. So, not a bad number. Of course, 40 to 60 percent confidence pretty much clocks in about the same level as my dog recognizing commands. So, quite sure how much of a success that is, but it's at least a benchmark number for me to work with. So, for those few of you who uh, actually do are do a little bit of programming on the side, just a little bit about the architecture. Again, this is a C++ based thing. Uh, it's built on the Qt toolkit, which is what we specialize on at ICS. Um, the front end is nice and configurable, so if I was in an audience where Jarvis wouldn't go over well, we, uh, we have a little more business oriented one that's kind of in, in gray and purple graphics, which we call Anita. It's a little more business friendly. Architecturally, we had to break out um, the processing loops for all of the different pieces into their own little threads. So voices, uh, gestures, and face recognition are all kind of running in separate pieces. They all do their own thing. Whenever anything is detected, it tells other parts of the system, hey, I got a gesture, hey, I got voice, whatever it may be. Uh, the advantage to this architecture is that I can actually pop out that gesture piece and I can put in a totally different piece of hardware like the Leap camera. So, Seems to play out fairly well. And we'll just skip that. Too much detail. All right. So where do I take Jarvis? And besides actually getting the voice recognition to work better? Well, on my to-do list for the coming year, uh, I want to explore other cameras. Okay, I started to do a Connect integration uh, back in the summer, and I honestly just never quite got it working. I was trying to really do some low-level stuff, and it, it didn't go well. Uh, fortunately, one of my colleagues at ICS actually found a third-party library that will solve this problem for me, so that's on my to-do list is to integrate that. Uh, again, the Leap camera. So that's this little guy here. I'll, I'll hook it up afterwards if anybody wants to play around with the visualizer. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, this came out back in July. Uh, we've got an early integration with Qt already done. And that's pretty much the first thing I'm going to do is really kind of get that working. And that'll give us the ability to explore gestures in a, a much richer environment. Once I can actually start getting individual finger motions, um, hand, roll, pitch, yaw, and the basic things like swipes, we can really start looking and saying, what do we want to do? Can we really play around and develop these types of gestural languages, either on a universal level or tied to specific applications? So that's probably the next thing I'll tackle. Voice. Hey, Obviously, Jarvis has some issues. Uh, I'm going to get away from the Intel one and go to the Microsoft Speech API. I've, I've heard some pretty good things about that. Uh, again, we have an early integration done. I just haven't had a chance to swap it out yet, um, mainly because we've been working with Intel, mainly because I didn't want to screw with my demo the week before a trade show. But that's kind of on the to-do list as well. Uh, I need to get away from this array mic. As we've seen, it has issues. I have heard other folks in the voice recognition world say that if you are using something that's much more targeted, get like a nice jawbone mic or something, eliminates a lot of the ambient noise problems, get much higher levels of accuracy. So that's very much in my to-do list. Uh, it was very interesting presenting this at a developer conference last week and saying that it only runs on Windows and watching the developers hiss at me and saying, where's Linux? It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. As soon as I go away from uh, the Intel specific solution, I can actually start to get things that are more Linux savvy. I don't personally care, I just want the best solution, but 
some developers are a little more fussy. Uh, and really the, the big thing that I don't think is going to happen in the short term, but I kind of alluded to it earlier, this notion of dictation and natural language parsing. It's a really interesting area to me. Uh, I, I looked at it years and years ago back in graduate school. Um, we actually wrote a, a LISP-based system, if anybody out there remembers LISP as well. Uh, we wrote a system that kind of stored knowledge in LISP and did command par um, language parsing and we could literally tell it the ball is red and say okay and ask what color is the ball and it would spit back red. And it's like, cool, I built a two-year-old. <laughs> so, so now how do I take this and actually take that type of language parsing and basically feed it in the input through um, a dictation system. You know, 20 years ago I had to type in that information. Now I should be able to talk to it and get that type of interaction. So I don't really want to write that from scratch. Hopefully I can find that type of a system that I can build off of, but if I have to roll up the sleeves and remember how LISP works, I may do so. So a couple things to leave you guys with. Um, first of all, you know, look around you for inspiration. Look to, look to the art world. Look at what you've read. Look at what you've seen at the movies, on TV. Any works of fiction that are out there. Anything that really moved you, that gave you that visceral emotional impact. It's like, yeah, that's cool, but we can't do that yet. Well, that's what we're here for as technologists, to get from the yet to the now. Okay. Working with natural user interfaces. It's going to be a paradigm shift. Um, the research that I've seen on that thus far says if we really want to get this right, we can't just take a current user interface that is dependent on a mouse and a keyboard. Those are really artificial concepts. If we want something that's truly going to be natural for people to use, we've got to be designing these things from the ground up. We need to have systems that are expecting natural input, that give responses natural output, and build accordingly. One of the folks at Leap, basically uh, noted to me that nobody really knew what to do with the mouse when it first came out either. You know, years and years ago when, when it was created, he, I forget the name of the fellow, but he was laughed at. Why do we need this? We, we type, we command line, that's, that's all well and good. What would we need this for? You know, jump ahead to now. I think we're on the verge of that type of a change coming forward with these new interfaces. The Leap guys are actually releasing uh, a version of their camera that's embedded into an HP laptop. I think that comes out like next month. I know it's been announced. So this is going to be embedded right into the skin of the laptop. What we do with that, I don't know, but this is what they're pushing for. You know, this, this type of an interface, these sensors are going to be out there. It's just a question of time. So there's a lot of research, and this is where we, if we put on our human factors hats, can really contribute. You know, how do we deal with these technologies? How do we assess the emotional impact of these capabilities? You know, both the cool factor, when it does work, and you know, the stress factor, the breach of confidence. How do we deal with those things? Is it worse when your computer does talk back to you or when it doesn't talk back to you? Well, it depends on what you're expecting to some degree. Those are the areas that we can really do some research in and help the technologists who are working on the nuts and bolts make the right decisions. And that's what's really going to drive these things forward. So that's what I've got. Hopefully you guys found this uh, at least somewhat interesting or entertaining, got some good information out of it. And uh, hopefully Jarvis and I will be back at a future meeting and actually be uh, a little more responsive. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have. Uh, a mic if someone has questions, but first I have a comment or a suggestion. Mm -hmm. One is, so you mentioned from the um, Star Trek communicator to the StarTAC phone was about mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. and you said, oh, I don't think the iPad was that far off from mm -hmm. the next gen mm -hmm. pad. It was like 24 years. So I can't do math. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but no, I, I did do that math mm -hmm. myself. And then uh, mm -hmm. you also may want to look at, um, you know, a lot of the breakthroughs in, in speech technology have been through um, pairing from local uh, detection and rejection, mm -hmm. passing the data up to the cloud for processing. Mm -hmm. uh, IBM, AT&T, and Nuance have um, services that can do that if you exhaust uh, what you're 
doing on the computer directly. So, you, so they're just passing the signal up to the cloud and something else is doing all the signal processing? Yeah. And you can have much okay. larger grammars and, okay. and all that kind of stuff. So check Good that out. Know. Start with Max. Hi, Jeff. Uh, just saying that uh, we're on the eve of a new gaming generation and uh, certainly Connect 2.0 is coming out in mm -hmm. two weeks. And um, it's interesting with uh, in concerns to gamers and the consumers and those gamers is that a lot of people were re rejecting the $100 extra price for the mm -hmm. Xbox One as opposed to the PS4 because of the Connect. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like consumers aren't even mm -hmm. willing to go with this gesture-based system mm -hmm. yet because they're feeling that it's not quite there yet. Um, do you have any thoughts about that or wanting to try the new Connect? Yeah, I, I kind of have a bigger toy budget than most people, so I don't think about It's like 100 bucks, see, it's, that's, that's beer money. Um, but you're right. I mean, to, to some folks, that type of a price point is a barrier to entry. Um, it's going to come down, though. You know, it's like any, any new hardware when it first comes out, you're going to get the early adopters who jump on it, and then the price comes down over time. I think the, even the basic Connect was a couple hundred dollars when it first came out, I think. And mm -hmm. they said, I got to use one for eight, you know, 80 over the summer. So yeah, I think you're right. I think it's something that the, the manufacturers are going to have to be aware of and eventually drive that price point down. Same has happened with the mouse. You know, mouse is, what, 10 bucks now? And years ago, it was a lot more. So it's something the manufacturers will have to deal with. Yes? This isn't really a question. It's more of a free association off your slide that mentioned uh, inspiration from fiction. Sure. Um, the first half is I saw an ad la just last week for a television remote control, which is shaped like Harry Potter's wand. And you teach it 16 gestures, mm -hmm. and you can use them for whatever your remote control can do. Mm -hmm. um, and the second half is, I was thinking about that while you were talking about this, and I thought, wow, if you added voice recognition, you know, mm -hmm. expelleramus, or, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you said channel before you waved it up or mm -hmm. down, or volume before you waved it up, yep. up and down, you'd get more, uh, more commands yep. and, and a more natural uh, interface. Yeah, and I, I, I touched on that briefly, just the notions of combining different modalities, you know, using, as you say, voice, that, that becomes your clutch. Channel, you know, interrupt this, whatever it may be. But yeah, <laughs> not that I've read this. <clears throat> I have a couple of real questions about your work, but I'd like to just preface it by saying, it seems like the really big, huge limitation with Siri, aside from reliability, is what all it's integrated into in the way of apps. And I've heard that same comment made by reviewers about the Leap Motion mm -hmm. collection of apps that, oh, so you didn't get the mic, okay. Um, I will ask a real question in a second, but I have an observation first, which is that a big limitation of Siri is the apps that it's integrated to and the consistency across those apps. Um, and I've heard that exact same complaint raised about the Leap Motion current collection of apps that, you know, every developer was really on their own with regard to the gestural system, and you don't get, you don't get an integrated language, an integrated approach to all the things you want to access. And presumably that's a problem. You, that's you're really trying to tackle in a central way in your work. Um, I, but my I, question I, about yeah. your work is, firstly. What is the kind of number of commands or range of complexity of the application that you're trying to have Jarvis be? And secondly, do you have a sense of what the division of labor should be between, say, the, the speech and the gesture modalities? Sure. So the range of commands is probably only about a dozen. I mean, this, this again, really, it's, it's PowerPoint when you get right down to it. There's a handful of things that it can actually do. You know, moving between the different slides, you know, slide up, slide down. Um, opening a file it does, let's see if this actually works. We've got a virtual laser pointer that's built into this. So that's obviously you know, purely gestural. Um, so those types of, of things are in there as well. But there's not, there's not a lot to this just because it's a fairly simple program. 
Now, if we were using, if we were doing something that was more complex, then I'd get beyond that range of a dozen or so. Uh, in terms of the the breakout things, like you know that laser pointer that I just showed, obviously is purely gestural. Uh, I can do voice commands for everything in here. I actually just choose not to, mainly because of false positive issues, for one thing, um, and it just to me got kind of old saying next, next, next. Now people do that, even in, in a regular presentation. I've, I've been doing a presentation with someone who has a, a partner, you know, a live agent, you just next slide, next slide. For me, I actually liked this type of emotion. For me, it was very fluid, it, it fits my style, so I tend to use that more. Um, I think I can, I can do everything with voice if I want to. Um, I can't do everything with, with gestures just because the language isn't rich enough with this hardware. Again, I've only got about five to eight hand gestures and they're not really the most natural in the world. So I didn't want to try to just kludge in, oh, I'll, I'll use gesture X for this and gesture Y for that. I've done that and I've literally been in cases of going, oh, was that thumbs up or the peace sign to trigger that? Just didn't make sense with the technology. And to your first observation, I actually, as I said, I met with the Leap guys last week their philosophy when they put this out, for, for better or for worse, was they didn't want to define a grammatical language. They actually wanted the developers to have the freedom to do whatever they want, which is a real nice goal. However, when you give people that much rope, they invariably will do bad things with it. And I think that's some of what happened with the leap is developers don't think like HCI people. You know, I'm, I'm this weird hybrid where I'm a programmer who cares about this stuff. Normally when I do an HCI type of talk, maybe 10% of the audience cares, the rest of them are surfing their emails. So the developers just kind of threw, oh, we can do gestures, cool, let's bup, 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 bup. okay, gestures, done. And they didn't think through the HCI component of it. And I, in this is personal opinion, I think that's why you end up with a lot of crappy gestural apps, just because the developers aren't thinking through the human factor side of it. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you talked about facial recognition that it can do. Can it do eye tracking? No. Okay. Easy is questions. It, I like those. Is that coming down? Is it is that coming down the pike? No idea. I mean, the, the, again, I'm limited by what the the base camera and the technology can do. Uh, if Intel supports it, I'm happy to try to use it. Mm -hmm. This is just a couple of postscripts on um, your. Sure. Responses. Yeah, uh, postscripts. Uh, one is it sounds like the principle that you would like to have for the division of labor between your voice and your gesture is you'd kind of like to use the gesture as an out of band way to do your control stuff. And you just are limited by the capability of gesture at the moment is preventing you from doing that. Kind of. I, I, find, I find the gestures more natural for moving around through the slides. So for, because for me, it's a spatial thing. It's a spatial thing, and okay. again, for, for me, it, it just it matches my presentation style. It's, a, it's an easy flow to do this as natural, go to the next slide or the previous slide. So that really works. For the other stuff, voice. Okay, and the other postscript is, I think human gesture is far less understood at the moment than natural lang than speech is, speech and language is. And so it's going to be far longer until we get integrated sets of gestures that are workable across a wide variety of applications. And you just gave one tiny example. You said, this is natural for me, without yep. even attempting to say whether it's going to be natural for anybody else. Yep. Thanks. Uh, hi. Um, QT Toolkit, how accurate is a face recognition? Um, so the, the SDK actually is from uh, Intel. QT is actually just a, a application framework that I used to build it in. I could have done it in MFC or something else. Um, but to the specifics of the facial recognition part, I don't know what the percentage is. Um, I have noticed that it's, I, I would say 90 plus percent, that's purely uh, you know, just experience. but. It, it gets it. it, it recognizes faces, it, it gets beards, it gets non-beards. Um, 
I'm sorry. If I stood in front of your PC, it, the blue light wouldn't have gone on. It would. No, it, oh, oh, I, for individual people. Is that yes. what you're asking? Yes. Would it know that's me what, versus you? That's right. It can do that. I don't know the level of accuracy, but it is possible to do. That's actually built in. That is built into the SDK. I'm sorry. I didn't okay. understand your question. I thought it was recognizing you. No, I could. Okay. I, I could lock Jarvis down to me. It's hard enough just getting it to work in general, so I'm not sure I'd want to do that. But in theory, I could. Yeah, the, the SDK does support recognizing individuals. So you just said keyed into what's been, been sort of challenging me. What's interesting about the Wii is it made some things that were difficult. If you're not a gamer, it was hard to game until the Wii came along. And then you could just play. And then the things you did in PowerPoint here, they're all relatively easy to me. But then when you said face recognition, I thought of things like login. It's a pain in the ass. And facial yep. recognition, if it came into play, gets interesting. I know who you mm -hmm. are when we come in. So I'm intrigued with what you think about what kinds of problems this can solve that are currently hard, as opposed to a series of problems navigating through PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, you're exploring things. You did nifty things, mm -hmm. but not things that are hard. Have right. you thought about the hard problems that are on the forefront that these kinds of things will help with? I've had enough time getting the easy things working, quite honestly. Um, but you're right. Log login's an interesting one. Anything that you're using biometrics for. Um, Depending on how accurate that scanner gets, I mean, it, how hard is it to fool it? Would you know? Would anyone else with a beard be recognized as me? I haven't kind of looked at it to that level. Um, for base gesture stuff, um, if the accuracy can can get up to what we want, and some of the other issues that that I talked about can be solved. Look, times when you can't touch a screen, you know, I use I use medical as an example. You know, telepresence applications, things um, even in the the commercial world. You know, you want to have a system that responds to people, but you may not, for whatever reason, want them to get right up to it. You know, I could see even a commercial kiosk or something. It might not be the the world's most important problem, but people would pay big bucks for something like that. So. There are a lot of situations to do it, and I admittedly haven't thought through, as you say, some of the, the hard problems, mainly because when I've been interacting with this, I've kind of had my developer hat on more than anything, just trying to get the base technology going. So I guess kind of do it, doing more of that type of research is, as I said, on, on the to-do list going forward. And, and I really am glad you asked that question, because it's kind of making me think now, where would I take this? Assuming I had all the technical nits out of the way, What's something that's a little more serious than Tony Stark's PowerPoint presentation? So, I'll get back to you on that. So, yes. so, so just a um, comment. I, I know I bought a Lenovo laptop 2009, and it had facial recognition down pretty darn well there, because my niece managed to lock me out of the computer with her face. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's out there already. Yeah, and that, that actually will work without the, the special camera. It's something I've noticed that when I unplug this and run it, uh, it will switch to the, the built-in mic, and it will switch to the webcam for the facial recognition. So that's at least smart enough to handle that. Cool. Any other questions or comments? Cool. Well, uh, I have one last comment. Mm -hmm. Besides, thank you very much tonight. This was really great. Um, but also, there was a... I forget if it was a particular Android phone that was released about a year or so ago that had face unlocking on the phone, but people could fool it with a photo. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. So it wasn't really doing anything with 3D, yeah. so you needed the other aspect. Yeah, okay. so I'd be interested if there would be a difference using the creative camera versus the built-in uh, camera. I will have to find that out. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you right. so much, Jeff. This was wonderful. Thanks, guys.